anyone who visits New York City will see all manner of different life forms. And you don't have to look far to realize that our planet is teeming with a diverse population of living creatures. And for centuries, we've been asking ourselves, how unusual is all this? What about the rest of the universe? Is our little planet Earth the only place where the action is? Are we special? I find it hard to believe the fact that we're the only people in this universe. We're definitely not alone. This is not just one universe, you know what I'm saying? There's like 100,000 million galaxy or galaxies in the universe. There's trillions in billions of universes. Whatever, the point is it's inconceivable how big things are. To think that we're alone here is ridiculous. Many people are ready, even eager to believe that we're not at all alone. And that's the view prevalent in lots of popular films and TV shows. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's an appealing fantasy. Star Trek. Star Wars. Men in Black. All portray a universe filled with a multitude of intelligent life forms. Show us the merchandise, you're gonna lose another head, G. Sometimes they're friendly, and sometimes they're not. Screenwriters have come up with some pretty interesting behaviors for their extraterrestrials. What's up? But they often ignore some basic principles of biology. For example, in the film Alien, a human being plays host to a parasitic alien hey. until it's ready to be born. Oh, God. This has long bothered biologist Jack Cohen. Alien is not concerned with the biology. You can't have a creature living in your chest, which is bigger than your heart, and you don't know it's there, and your immune system isn't turned on, particularly if it's never seen a human being before. It doesn't work biologically. But it works as a film, because you see the thing coming out of the chest, and it's exactly what they want. It's a horror film. Another classic horror image of extraterrestrials shows them as giant insects, the alien of choice for the film Starship Trooper. But according to the laws of physics, this kind of anatomy is impossible. It's like bringing a mouse up to be the size of an elephant. Its little thin legs wouldn't take the weight and they would break. You have to redesign. And it's a lot easier to have a terrifying film with giant ants. As unscientific as the oversized insects of Starship Troopers are, at least they don't look like people. By far, most films, even the ones with huge special effects budgets, depict aliens that actually look like they evolved on Earth because they have faces that resemble ours. Nearly all the vertebrates we see around us, humans included, have faces with two eyes, two nostrils, and a mouth below. This configuration came from a common ancestor who lived hundreds of millions of years ago. Now, when we look at these aliens, and they've got faces with two eyes and a nose and a mouth, they can't be aliens. They must have developed on Earth. They must share that same ancestor, or they wouldn't have faces like that. We expect a living thing, a dog or a cat, or even a fish, to have a face. Therefore, when we invent something for a film, we give it a face, and that really enables the, the people who are watching to get moved by it. <laughs> Real aliens can't be like that. Cute. Real aliens? What are we talking about? 
UFO sightings and abductions that show up in tabloids? I think they have traveled to this planet. They might have been here years ago, but they became extinct just like the dinosaur did. We've been visited. Those lights in the sky are all weather balloons. Hmm. There are some people who believe that aliens are already among us, but there's no credible evidence. There's nothing in any of these stories that can't be explained in some other more rational way. And of course, some people are just plumb crazy. But is it crazy to believe that somewhere beyond our planet, life has taken root? Many scientists would say it's not only possible, but likely. One of the believers is Frank Drake. I first believed there was life beyond Earth when I was eight years old. Not for any good reason, only because my father told me there were other planets, something like the Earth out there. And to my young mind, that meant places just like where I lived with houses and streets and, in fact, creatures that looked just like me, which was certainly wrong. But I believed. Drake's childhood dreams led him to a career in radio astronomy. And he soon began wondering whether somewhere among the stars there might exist aliens who, like us, had mastered radio. Hello. Ever since humans learned how to broadcast radio waves, we've been leaking them out into the cosmos. Everything from Duke Ellington to I Love Lucy to the speeches of world leaders is, thanks to our ingenuity, now traveling across space at the speed of light. Drake reasoned that if aliens were transmitting radio signals of their own, we might be able to detect them. And so he created the first experiment for SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's now survived an on, an off, and a second For on. decades, SETI astronomers have been scanning the stars of the Milky Way galaxy, searching for signs of advanced alien civilizations. Their goal is the ultimate prize in the life-finding game. Someone out there we can talk to. So nothing to do but sit here and wait for them to call. Yeah, and on cue, they've called. SETI faces enormous challenges, not least of which is the sheer size of our galaxy. The Milky Way has hundreds of billions of stars swirling in a giant spiral about 100,000 light years wide. That's 600 quadrillion miles. So what are the chances of finding intelligent aliens in all that real estate? Early in his quest, Frank Drake came up with an equation to guide him. Actually, I first invented the equation as the agenda for a meeting. It seemed pretty obvious. This was a meeting about life in space, and I asked the question, what do we need to know about? And I realized if you multiply them all together, you get the number n. The now famous 